Hello, and thank you for joining us today for this third Thursday webinar. My name is Carol Blymeyer, and I'm a policy consultant for the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and I'll be your moderator for today's webinar. Today, our panelists will discuss Parkinson's policy priorities that advance research toward a cure and support people and families with Parkinson's. We'll talk about how you can reach out to your state and federal elected officials to help influence change on behalf of the Parkinson's community. And we'll discuss the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, which was recently introduced into Congress and is the first legislation of its kind that will create a comprehensive, coordinated approach to ending Parkinson's. If you have a question during our time together today, you can type it into the Q&A box near the middle of your screen. Uh, the foundation staff and our panelists will get to as many as we can. For helpful information on today's topics and to download the slides, please check out the resource list on your screen. And if you would like to put closed captioning on your screen, please click the CC button on the bottom right of the media player on your screen. We've got a lot to discuss today, so let's get started. Let's meet our panelists. First, I'd like to introduce Dustin Watson. Dustin is the Director of Government Relations at the Michael J. Fox Foundation, and he played a pivotal role working with Congress on the National Plan to End Parkinson's legislation. Also joining us is Amy Lindberg. Amy is a retired Navy officer, and she lives in Wilmington, North Carolina. She was diagnosed with Parkinson's in 2017, and she's an active Michael J. Fox Foundation policy advocate and ambassador. And let's welcome Dana Richter. Dana is a senior policy advisor and general counsel in the office of Senator Shelley Moore Capito of West Virginia. All right, let's get started. Dustin, I would like to have you get our conversation going. Could you tell us why the foundation has a government relations team and what role public policy plays when it comes to Parkinson's disease? Sure, sure. Thanks, Carol. So at, at our core, the Michael J. Fox Foundation is a research organization. And we're looking to enhance treatment for Parkinson's and ultimately to find a cure. Our approach is aggressive, it's comprehensive, and it takes multiple paths. One path is through public policy created by the federal and state regulations. And so our policy team makes it a point to focus on issues related to things like this is where we engage on issues related to Medicare because 90% of the and so we advocate for legislation to make medications and treatments affordable and services accessible such as things like telehealth. We look at health research funding and we continue to encourage the federal government to invest more, for example, at the National Institutes of Health, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the Food and Drug Administration, and Department of Veterans Affairs. We dig into policy issues around environmental triggers for Parkinson's like exposures to dangerous toxins, such as pesticides, insecticides, and herbicides like Paraquat, plus policies for soldiers who are exposed to toxins from burn pits, or from jet fuel, coming out of battle situations with traumatic brain injury or head trauma. We cover research freedom issues, such as access to and the use of medical cannabis for clinical research, and we're working on long-term care issues related to nursing home, hospice, and palliative care services. Finally, and in the spirit of getting closer to a cure and supporting our families, when you wrap up all these issues together and you work with so many different stakeholders, we figured it was time for the federal government to step up and create a national plan to end Parkinson's. And I know we'll be covering that issue soon. So I'm gonna pause here and Carol, I'm gonna turn it back over to you. And in addition to the federal work that the foundation does, I know there's also a lot of activity going on in terms of reaching out to state legislatures and governor's offices in 
almost all 50 states. Is that right, Dustin? Yes, uh, our state government relations program is up and running. It's new, lots of wins this year, um, which I can cover now or uh, in a few, you, Carol. We'll talk to, we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, I would actually love, Amy, um, you know, you have been incredibly active in terms of reaching out to your members of Congress about the issues that matter to you and to others who are living with Parkinson's. Could you tell us a little bit about why advocacy is so important to you? Well, as a TCE exposed veteran from Camp Lejeune's contaminated water back in the 80s, I'll tell you when I finally found out that I had a disease such as Parkinson's um, and it was related specifically to TCE in the water that I drank and bathed in and um, um, breathed from plumes underground. Um, I became very, very committed to wanting to help people learn about the hazards of this, uh, this toxin and other neurotoxins. Um, I became very much involved with uh, what was a red letter campaign after I read the book, Ending Parkinson's Disease. It, your CEO, your former CEO, Todd Scherer, who was one of the authors, and uh, Dr. Ray Dorsey and, and others. But I learned about um, how to advocate through uh, letter writing campaigns and things like that. And then I found out in uh, the Michael J. Fox uh, website that you can just go and use uh, pre-formatted emails uh, that can effectively target specific topics to our legislators. And I found out that it's very easy to do that. And I started to utilize those approaches and tell my friends about it. And before you knew it, we had you know hundreds of people writing uh, to our legislators and, and getting good advocacy work done at a very easy, uh, with a very easy approach. So I'm, I'm currently in the Michael J. Fox working group for veterans and I'm in the ambassador training I'm not one that wants to be a spokesperson or, or is, is very good at that anymore. I have some mild cognitive issues. So what I found helpful is, is just knowing that the organization has tools that we can use and, and, and simply complete forms, click buttons. I mean, anyone can do that and be an advocate without necessarily getting out and being on TV or a webinar like this, for instance. That's a really good point. Um, Dana, who I will tell all of you is coming to us live from Capitol Hill in Senator Capito's office. Dana, you and your colleagues on Capitol Hill are on the receiving end of advocacy and constituent outreach on every issue under the sun, including Parkinson's disease. Could you tell us a little bit about why it's important for people to reach out to their federal and state elected officials and, and share with us a, just kind of what some of the most effective ways are to do that? Sure, thanks so much, Carol. And thanks everyone for having me join you today. As Carol mentioned, I am coming live from the Russell building um, on the Senate side of um, the Capitol. Um, well, first of all, we can only act. One of the reasons that advocacy is so important is we can only act on what we are asked to do and what people and what we know is going on. So I often tell people that when I'm meeting with them, there can be some wonderful, wonderful bills and some wonderful, wonderful things going on. But unless I know it and my boss knows it, we really can't be effective in working on it. Right now, um, we are getting at the end of a Congress. A Congress is the kind of technical term for the two-year period. Um, each Congress is a two-year period. So we're getting to the end of the 117th Congress. And there are about 6,000 bills in the House and I'm, or in the Senate, and I'm guessing about 8,000 bills in the, in the House. And so, as you can tell, really, really good bills can get lost in that mix. And obviously, you know, there's some bills that everyone's working on. You know, we there was just a you know really big bill and the president signs it. 
But then there's also a lot of really good bills that we just don't know about. And I mean, one thing I always tell advocates is it's not important to know every fact and figure about Parkinson's. We'd much rather hear your story and hear about how this has impacted you and why the bill or the resolution or or whatever action you're talking to us about, why it's so important to you and how it's going to impact your life, then knowing that there are, you know, however many advocates there are in West Virginia or North Carolina and prevalence rates and mortality rates. And we can all find that on the computer. What you're bringing to us that we can't get anywhere else is your experience and, and your lived knowledge. And so that's what we really, really appreciate. And I, I have worked on both the House side and the Senate side, and I can tell you that makes the most effective advocate. And then the other thing I always tell advocates is follow up. Um, you're, for, you're gonna start, think of it as you're forming a relationship. So the first time you talk to someone, you're introducing yourself, you're introducing um, the issues that you care about and that the Michael J. Fox Foundation cares about. And, but that's just an introduction. So you're going to want to, I'm not saying call every day by any means or email, but you're going to want to say, maybe at the end of your meeting, say, would it be all right if I follow up in a couple of weeks? Is there a good time for me to follow up? And that way you're giving them some accountability. And I can tell you that, hey, I love a meeting that ends with no re ask or no request or and no follow up. But there's a chance that I'm going to move on to the next 14 things that are coming across my plate. And I might not remember, but when you reach back out, I go, oh, yes, like, let me re let me talk to the senator about that again. And the other thing I will tell you, and then I will I will wrap up, is that um, a lot of the age you're going to meet, I'm actually on the older side of most of the age you're going to meet on Capitol Hill. And um, a lot of times people come and they, you know, they're upset if they're not going to meet with a senator or your, your member of Congress. And... Of course, I'm biased because I have been staff for a long time, but the staff are pretty invaluable in they decide what the member hears. And so don't certainly don't think you're wasting time by talking with staff members because they're the ones who are going to their job is to kind of triage what the senator or that or the representative sees. And so you want them to understand your issues so that when they're talking to the center and giving them a recap of what's going on and what's important that they pay attention to, that your issue's there. So I always tell people that because people are just, people all of a sudden go and you know meet with a 24-year-old and think, oh my gosh, what am I doing? But that person has the ability to really get, get your issue moving. Well, and what I think, you know, what you said in the beginning of this part of the conversation is that there is so much activity on Capitol Hill that it is really important for our community to raise these issues with you so that they can be prioritized um, and that we can add voices and advocates can tell stories about why these bills and pieces of legislation and laws matter. I would imagine that advocacy kind of has changed uh, given COVID and a lot of the changes in all of the ways that we communicate with one another. Um, could you talk a little bit about, you know, the importance of, or, or kind of the best ways for people to reach out? You know, Amy talked about, you know, kind of doing some of the action alerts and sending emails. Could you talk a little bit about, you know, phone calls or coming to, you know, when when members of Congress are back in their states or back in their districts, they hold town hall meetings or you could even exactly. call their scheduler and schedule something. Could you talk a little bit about some of the best ways or some of the more effective ways to make that personal contact? I think it's a, sort of an all of the above. Okay, I, I think, cool. you know, obviously you know, in-person meetings or to be honest, virtual meetings. Um, we're doing a lot of virtual meetings. As some of you probably know, the build, the congressional office buildings are still closed to the public. Um, we can do some meetings, but we're not doing a, a ton of them in person at this point still. And some of that's because of obviously the COVID pandemic. Some of that's because um, we're short on Capitol Police officers. And so for security purposes. Um, the buildings have remained closed. 
But having said that, um, we have found that you can be extremely effective over, um, you know, different platforms to reach virtually. And one of the nice parts about that is I feel that a lot more people have access to their members of Congress and their staff than before. Because if you're, you know, Amy was talking about, you know, having some mild cognitive decline, whether there's, I know there's other people with Parkinson's who have much more severe symptoms that don't make traveling or doing a in-person, you know, day where you're walking from building to building and the easiest thing. So this is a great way to be able to talk to your members of Congress and their staffs without leaving. As far as letters and phone calls, those are very effective. They also keep these issues alive. They let the member know that it's not just you or you and your husband or partner or neighbors. There's a whole lot of people in the state or district who care about this issue. And so I think, as I said, it's all the above. You want to. And then as you continue going forward, you know, whether it's the ambassador program or other things, there's, you know, look at all the ways that you can be an effective advocate. Well, the advocacy community within our Parkinson's community is strong and we have a lot of collective energy um, that has moved a lot of policy work forward in the past year to a few years. Dustin, what I would love to have you do next is kind of share with everyone watching what some of these most recent progress uh, moments have been on policy issues that matter most to, uh, to the Parkinson's community. Would you mind sharing some of those with us? Sure, Carol, thanks again. Yep, so we're, we're making great progress um, with federal research funding. And when I say we, I really mean the collective we, which includes the thousands of advocates who are lobbying their lawmakers for positive change. Um, so uh, in addition to maintaining funds at the Parkinson's Research Program at the Department of Defense, Congress gave the agency funding for two new programs. So one is a toxic exposures research program, and that's, that's funded at $30 million. And a second is the traumatic brain injury and neurodegenerative, neurodegenerative disease program. And that was actually established at 60 million, but Congress has actually upped it again this year, another 5 million for a total of 65 million. So when you combine the two new programs, that's $95 million in new research funding. Now, some of that money, not all of it, uh, is gonna be allocated for Parkinson's research. So if there's researchers that are tuning into the webinar today, we encourage you to apply for the federal funding. And if you need our assistance, we can point you in the right direction. Uh, we're also doing very well with the Department of Veterans Affairs. The U.S. Senate is proposing a 50% increase for the VA's Parkinson's Centers of Excellence to hire some additional staff and expand the number of sites beyond the current six. So there are three Parkinson's Centers of Excellence on the West Coast, there's two on the East Coast, and there's one in Texas. And securing this additional funding is going to be important because currently there's no sites really serving middle America, nor in the deep southeast region of the country. So these specialty care centers, they were established 20 years ago with very limited funding from Congress uh, and with the intent to provide comprehensive care for our military veterans living with Parkinson's. Now, over the same 20 year period, the number of veterans diagnosed with Parkinson's has increased by a whopping 37%. So from 80,000 veterans 20 years ago to now over 110,000 plus today. But the annual operating budget for these specialty care centers has risen just a tiny bit over those 20 years. So this proposed extra funding, it will represent the most significant budget expansion ever for the VA Parkinson centers. And so we're gonna continue to advocate for that very hard. Um, we can go to the next slide, please. 
Okay, so as, um, as part of the recently passed Inflation Reduction Act, uh, we have lobbied for years for key provisions that were ultimately included in the approved bill. So one was the establishment of a $2,000 out-of-pocket cap on prescription drug medication not reimbursed under Medicare Part B, and relatedly, allowing Medicare beneficiaries to pay the here versus having to pay the bill all at one time. And that's referred to as a uh, President Biden signed the bill into law this week, and our team is sending an update to our advocates today. Um, we also in, uh, continue to advocate for legislation that would reduce barriers and allow scientists to expand research related to the use of medical cannabis. Um, the purpose here is to assess cannabis as a possible treatment option for managing symptoms of Parkinson's. Um, Politically, the U.S. House of Representatives recently passed a bill we support, and it's awaiting final action in the Senate. And since the Senate approved very similar legislation in the spring, we expect this slightly revised bill to be passed again this year. And then, as you mentioned previously, and um, uh, last but certainly far, far from least, um, the foundation state government relations efforts this year, who are, which are led by my colleague, Julia Wooster, um, she just continues to have an incredible legislative season. Uh, working alongside local advocates, um, bills to establish Parkinson registries were passed in three states this year. Uh, they include West Virginia, South Carolina, and Maryland. Uh, and a fourth registry bill in the state of Ohio is expected to have a final vote later this year. Um, the registries will collect patient population data, and this will feed into the federal database housed at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, which we also support at the federal level. Um, data uh, that is collected, that's gonna result in more research. The more research that we do, that's gonna get us closer to a cure. So I'll pause here and turn it back over to you, Carol. That is really interesting a lot of a lot of progress this year and this might be the first time that some of our friends in the parkinson's community are learning about what role federal and state governments play when it comes to parkinson's research and care and all of this progress certainly sets the stage for what i'd like us all to talk about next which is the first legislation of its kind in Congress, uh, the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act. Dustin, could you walk us through what this legislation is, what it does, and then we'll also have Dana and Amy share their perspectives on this as well. But Dustin, if you could just give us a top line of what this bill does, and then let's dig into it and We'll all talk about how advocates can get involved and get this passed. Great, great. I'll try and touch upon all, all points in the next few minutes. Yeah, so the, the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, it is the most comprehensive, it is the most robust piece of legislation specific to Parkinson's ever proposed in the U.S. Congress. It is bipartisan. It's supported by both Democrats and Republicans. It is common sense. It is non-controversial, and it comes with no cost to the federal government. Uh, it was recently introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives by Congressman Paul Tonko, he's a Democrat out of New York, and Congressman Gus Bilharakis, Republican out of Florida. The bill number in the House is H.R. 8585, kind of rolls off the tongue very nicely. Um, <laughs> Senator Chris Murphy, Democrat out of Connecticut, and Senator Sally Moore Capito, Republican out of West Virginia. Uh, they are planning to introduce a companion bill in September. And this is where Dana has been extremely instrumental in supporting us and working with us very closely to get this done. Um, each of the congressional sponsors I just mentioned, they're all longtime supporters of the Parkinson's community. And we are extremely grateful for their leadership. Um, 
with the bill itself, we are not shy about acknowledging that the legislation is largely modeled after the success of the Alzheimer's plan, which Congress approved 10 years ago. And fast forward to today, that has resulted in a quadrupling of federal funding for, the, uh, for Alzheimer's research um, at the federal level. Parkinson's is now the fastest growing neurological disease in the world. And yet the US federal research investment has largely remained stagnant. Uh, there are currently 1 million Americans living with Parkinson's, including 110,000 military veterans. The annual cost to the nation for caring for individuals with Parkinson's is now $52 billion. That's 52 billion with a B. And we know that number is going to grow. And by the year 2037, we expect that that annual cost will be a whopping $80 billion. And yet the federal investment for Parkinson's research has been stuck at around $250 million a year. So the US funds Parkinson's research at $250 million but it spends right now 52 billion to care for those living with, Bar with Parkinson's. And so we need to flip that equation. We know that the more funding we put towards research, the faster we're gonna get to a cure and we can wipe away the financial impact on government, on families and change lives for the better. So we think it's time once and for all for the best of the best federal and non-federal stakeholders to come together through a national plan to end Parkinson's. And so at this point we can ask ourselves, okay, so what does the bill do? It proposes a public private effort centered on creating a plan to treat, cure and prevent Parkinson's. The bill itself requires the Secretary of Health and Human Services to do an assessment that are all things related to Parkinson's across the federal government. The Secretary will also create a Parkinson's Advisory Council. This council will include over a dozen federal agency representatives who work in that Parkinson's space. It will also include about 17 non-federal members and these will include patients, caregivers, researchers, clinicians, and representatives from nonprofit organizations like the Michael J. Fox Foundation and others. The council will be responsible for creating a report. That report will go both to the Secretary of Health and Human Services and to Congress. And within that report, there will be recommendations on improving federal programs dedicated to Parkinson's, reducing the financial impact Parkinson's has on government and on families. It will look at and make recommendations for enhancing health outcomes, eliminating environmental triggers, and ultimately recommendations for preventing the disease. Um, the Secretary of Health and Human Services will also be asked to, to to produce a similar report to Congress. So in a sense, we have a system of checks and balances in place to ensure Congress hears directly from the Parkinson's Advisory Council and from the Secretary of Health and Human Services. Um, and I know we'll be talking about ways to um, engage advocates, but as we take steps to lobby our lawmakers, it's going to be just as important to raise awareness about the legislation and get many more people involved. And we all know Parkinson's takes folks on a journey that includes so many different stakeholders and so many different touch points with a variety of different people and professions. We need to let all people know about the national plan to end Parkinson's legislation. So as Part of the webinar for those who are listening, for those who will uh, be tuning in on their own time and, and downloading the webinar, please tell your friends and your family members about this legislation. Tell your doctors, your neurologist, your movement disorder specialist, your pharmacist, tell your physical therapist. 
your occupational therapist, your speech language pathologist, tell your social worker, your mental health provider, your nurse care coordinator. If you're involved with clinical research, tell the clinicians, tell the researchers about this bill. We need all of these people and their voices to get this bill passed this year. So I'm gonna stop there, Carol, and turn it back over to you. Dana, what I would love for you to talk, so the bill was introduced in the House uh, at the end of July. So the next step, I'm not gonna do the schoolhouse rock, I'm just a bit <laughs> Capitol Hill. So we have, it gets introduced in the House with both a Republican and a Democrat sponsor, and then the Senate, there's also a bill intro with a Republican and a Democrat. Will you tell us a little bit about, you know, kind of the process of, of what this bill goes through and then how it gets to where it could, you know, be passed and talk a little bit about, you know, the Senate's involvement in this as well? Sure. No. Well, and first I wanted to, um, I have to give a shout out to George Manahan, who's an, who's an exceptional advocate in West Virginia. And his advocacy is actually what brought this to the senator's attention. Um, the senator's been involved in the um, Alzheimer's plan and was very familiar with the legislation. So this made a lot of sense to her, but he did a great job of advocating to the senator. So he's a great example of um, why advocacy is so important. Um, but so as, you know, both Carol, Carol and Dustin said, it, it, it will be introduced. I am joined by my counterpart in Senator um, Chris Murphy from Connecticut's office. Jackie is wonderful, and we are very excited to work together on this. And we looked at the calendar, and the Senate's been very busy working on a number of a number of the bills that um, Dustin mentioned. And so we de we determined that for us, the best time to introduce was in September. Um, Congress will be in session for most of the month, and it gives us a chance to really use that opportunity to talk to a lot of our champions. We're depending on all of you and all of your all of the people that Dustin mentioned to um, get the word out on the bill, because how it works is we will introduce, hopefully with um, what we call up here, original co-sponsors. That simply means the people who go on the bill the day it's introduced. Um, we'll introduce with some folks, hopefully, and then we're going to add folks. Um, because the Senate's 50-50 um, right now, we will probably, at the beginning at least, add in bipartisan pairs. Um, this is very common in the Senate right now, since it is, because we want to show Parkinson's could care less whether you're a Republican or a Democrat or have no party affiliation at all. And that's, and that's you know, the, that's the important thing here. Um, it doesn't matter. But because we are divided, it is good to continue that message by showing that this is something that both parties care about. So we are going to hopefully have a rush of wonderful co-sponsors from all of your great advocacy work. And at that point, um, when it's introduced, I'll be going to, this bill will go through a committee in the Senate called the Health Education Labor Pensions Committee, which has the very useful acronym HELP. Um, and so at that point, I will, when we introduce, I will make sure the committee's aware of the bill and aware that the senator would like to see this bill move forward. The more co-sponsors we can get, the more they're going to pay attention, for lack of a better term. They're going to, because, you know, the more people they hear from and the more, you know, traction this bill's getting and as our co-sponsor numbers build up, that they have more incentive to move forward with this. And so at some point, our goal will be to get the bill into something we call a markup, which back in the day, they used to actually take out their pencils and pens and actually make changes to the bill to make it something that the majority of the committee um, could approve. To be honest, at this point, it's mainly a done deal by the time it gets to with a committee markup but the terminology stays the same. And once it gets through that process, it's ready to go to the, the floor of the Senate. And at that point, we're hopeful that it will overwhelmingly pass. And then we'll t hopefully by that point, the, the House bill has gone on a very similar journey. 
um, from being introduced to, to gathering co-sponsors to going to over there, it's the Energy and Commerce Committee. Um, and then hopefully it has already passed the floor. And at that point, our bills as written are identical, but as I said, there's a chance that there could be changes made. So look at the two different bills that have been passed, figure out any differences through something called, they call a conference committee, and come up with a final bill that will then, if there were changes, will need to be passed. And then, then hopefully we will see a bill go to the president to be signed into law. Having said that, that's the path. There are mm -hmm. always a lot of um, fits and starts. Um, it's not unusual for a bill to um, go through this process at, for several Congresses. Um, as I said, we're in the 117th Congress. We'll finish that at the end of the year. And at the end of the year, what happens, is, at the end of a Congress, what happens, which is the two-year period, it's sort of like Monopoly, you know, you go to back to the start and all your co-sponsors get wiped out and you have to be reintroduced and um, you have to start over. But the good part is the momentum that you've built doesn't have to start over. So the more co-sponsors we can get, even if, for, even if we're not able to get it done by the end of the year, it's much easier to what we call rolling people back on. Because you're like, okay, you've already, you already have vetted this bill and decided it's something you support. So we just need you to sign back on. So if, that, if that's the case, um, then we, that's how we'll start back up. And then we have two more years to get it passed. Um, remember, there are also in the Senate about 6,000 other bills going through this same process and all trying to do the exact same thing. So that's why there's a glut trying to get bills marked up and to the floor. So it's important to show as much support as possible so your bill stands out and that you can show, we all know how important this bill is. Um, and it's just important to share that with, the, with um, your members of Congress. So we can really make this bill stand out from the masses. Well, and this, let's also be super clear uh, with everyone listening and watching that this is a bill for and by the Parkinson's community. This is a bill that every Parkinson's nonprofit organization, every Parkinson's group and chapter and association, we are all working together um, on this bill and on making those phones ring on Capitol Hill. I know there was a question submitted in the chat, you know, are, is MJFF working with other Parkinson's organizations? And um, I will answer that directly by saying we, we all work on this together before taking anything anywhere. This is the voice of the community. This is the energy and the excitement around this bill has galvanized the community such that, that this is a bill that voices will and do need to weigh in on to get this past this session. Um, Amy, you know, we're, we're going to show a, a video in just about a minute um, that, we, that can show advocates and all of you how to get involved and use your voice on this. Amy, you're living with Parkinson's disease. When you heard the news that there is a bill introduced in Congress that's going to create this national plan to end Parkinson's, what does that mean to you? Well, Carol, you, you know, like Dustin said, PD is the fastest growing neurological disease in the world. And it's, it's doubled since 1990. It's going to double again in the next generation, certainly by 2040, if, if we don't make changes. So there's an impetus upon us. And this bill gives us hope. It lets us know that, um, I'm so, I'm so excited. <laughs> It, it lets us know that there's a dedicated plan with several agencies, not just one, that can basically funnel and make efficient the efforts of so many different organizations and people. It's just incredible. I'm excited to be a part of it and to get um, all those thousands, over a million of us involved in supporting the effort because we can and because Michael J. Fox Foundation has given us the tools 
no matter whether or not you have um, certain handicaps due to the disease, there are different ways in which you can advocate from home. Um, phone, text, email. So thank you to the foundation and to the speakers today for making this so abundantly clear that we do have hope. Thank you. Amy, you and the more than 1 million people living with Parkinson's and family members and friends and caregivers, you are the reason why we do this. Um, Christina, will you roll the video that we have that can show all of our, our viewers how easy it is to complete a message to your members of Congress? Completing an action alert is easy. Click take action, then contact your policymakers on our homepage. Scroll down to the National Blend Action Alert, click take action. And here it is. You'll enter in your contact information and the system will auto populate a pre-written message you can send directly to your representative. It'll ask them to become a co-sponsor on this important bill. It takes about a minute or less to do. You'll enter your name, your address, phone number and email address. And then after that, it'll ask you to share your connection to Parkinson's disease, your interest in government advocacy, any military service, and then your interest in receiving communications from the foundation. And once you're done filling out all the information, you will click preview letter. And there it is, a pre-written message to your legislator. Click submit and you can rest assured your message has gone successfully to your representative. It really is so easy to do. I, in fact, I did mine right before we started this webinar and it did take less than a minute um, and it was easy. What's um, great about the form is that I literally started entering my street number and the first few letters of my street name and then it auto-populated my address for me um, because I believe it's synced with the Google street address system. So as long as your address appears in that window and you make sure your zip code is there, it's super easy. I will also say that this action alert is only available to people in the United States um, because this is an issue that is um, happening only in the United States for right now. Those of you living outside the US, please tell all your friends, relatives, family, colleagues, co-workers who do live in the U.S. that they can fill it out. Before we continue our conversation about the National Plan to End Parkinson's Act, I'd like to shine the spotlight on the Foundation's landmark study, the Parkinson's Progression Markers Initiative. It's also known as PPMI. PPMI aims to change everything about how Parkinson's is diagnosed, treated, and potentially prevented. And the study is looking for volunteers to participate. So those who have recently been diagnosed with Parkinson's, they can play a critical role in this important work. So you can click on the link in the resource list to learn more. And the online part of the PPMI study is open to anyone over the age of 18 living in the United States. To join that study, you can click the Get Started button in the take action box on the bottom right hand side of your screen. Let's get back into our conversation about the national plan to end Parkinson's Act and let's talk about all the ways our community can get involved. As we have this part of the conversation, I am going to scan the chat and the questions that are coming in. We're getting amazing questions about this. Um, to sign up for the latest and greatest updates because we will be emailing the community quite a bit about this. There will be moments where we might need some of you to apply a little heat, apply a little pressure to your members of Congress. Uh, you can go to michaeljfox.org slash advocacy. Go ahead and sign up there. You can also email us at policy at michaeljfox.org. Tell us you want to be involved. 
we'll we'll get you all roped in and we'll we'll get you involved in this incredible movement. Dana, you shared earlier in our conversation about the effective ways that people can reach out to members of Congress to advocate on an issue and this issue in particular. We have some questions in the chat of people wondering, you know, is a phone call better than a meeting or should I do the action alert only? And what about a separate email? And I think you said earlier, like all of the above, try Definitely. all of it. Um, anything else you want to add about ways in which people can professionally, you know, and appropriately reach out? You don't want people emailing you six times a day on this, I'm guessing. Right? Exactly. No, I think one thing that you can do if you can personalize it. I mean, I talked a little earlier about um, sharing your story. Um, I think that's really important. Uh, if you're comfortable with sharing your story, I think that can make a very that's very impactful. The other thing is, while everyone I know is incredibly enthusiastic, you really want to stick to your district and your state. Um, it's not that, you know, I know my office doesn't care about other people from other states. It's just that that's our job is to, you know, really reply to our constituents. So a lot of times we have to triage and just reply to our constituents. So really stick with those who represent your state. Um, because I hate to say it, but, you know, you can say I'm going to go and do all 50 states. Well, that's going to be a lot of work that's not going to get a lot of return. So stick with your state and stick with your two senators and your representative as as your focus. And but feel free, like let people know about your specific story. Um, if you feel like you're up to it and want to set up a meeting, I think meetings are incredibly um, important and useful. But if not, emails. Facts, well, I guess we're not doing faxes anymore. I'm mm -hmm. aging myself. Calls, um, they're all they're all fabulous because um, they're, they're really building the momentum and that's what we want is to get the word out there. Dustin, you have been in meetings all year with our Parkinson's community and, and all of the work and all of the conversations that have gone on. How would you encourage our community to best channel the energy and the excitement and all of the questions that I know that we're getting on this. Yeah, uh, be comfortable with it, with whatever uh, choice of advocacy you would like to pursue, because I'm sure the audience today, um, it's probably a mix of people who are hearing about advocacy for the first time to some folks who are very familiar with emailing their members of Congress or their state legislators or putting those phone calls in, to some who may know their lawmakers on a first name basis. So I would say no matter where you might be in the advocacy journey, um, I'd only like to stress kind of two things. One, know that you have a team at the Michael J. Fox Foundation who is ready to support you and two, meeting with your lawmakers at home, just like Dana was just describing, back in those local communities, that's extremely effective. And I think much more effective than making the costly trip to Washington, DC, yes. especially at this point where the Capitol Hill is largely just still too secure to maneuver through and get the meetings that you want in the most um, effective ways. So our Dustin, team, I wanted, we, oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, I just wanted to make one point too. Each office on Capitol Hill is kind of its own little kingdom, imagine. So each office <laughs> makes their own policies, rules, and this goes for everything. But what my office does and the meetings that we're willing to do in person aren't gonna, you know, might not be the same as 99 other senators. So just because you hear from one person that, oh, she had an in-person meeting or, oh, they're only doing virtual or oh, that's a one person, that's one office. And that goes for the house side as well. So I just did want to say that because I didn't want anyone to think that what we're doing or what any other office is doing is something, is what every office is doing because they really are all separate little kingdoms. Sorry right, to interrupt. Right. No, no, that's fine. And I, I will piggyback on that and just continue to stress 
our team is ready to support any advocates who want to have a meeting, virtual or in person, preferably again in district or in state. We are happy to do that. We can supply talking points, advice, and guidance. Uh, we can organize the meetings. We can join you for those meetings. We can help prepare for those meetings. We can handle the follow up. Um, the point is, wherever you want our help we can insert ourselves um and if you know if you're not already a member of the parkinson's policy network and i know it's it's posted right here first at the top bullet on the slide please register with us uh, michaeljfox.org advocacy again through that video it only takes about a minute to sign up with us once you do, you're going to get regular updates. You're going to get those calls to actions. And we're going to mobilize folks at the times when they are needed most to contact their lawmakers. Um, right now, the U.S. House and Senate, they're in recess. They're back home in their districts and states. So now is a perfect opportunity to attend a hall, town hall meeting, or work with us to schedule a local meeting, we would be happy to do it. Again, it can be virtual or in person. It's an opportunity to raise the national plan to end Parkinson's. Um, ask them to co-sponsor the bill. If they're already a co-sponsor, thank them and discuss other important issues related to Parkinson's. And again, I just wanna stress, we can help with all of that. Um, if you're interested in meetings, um, or you just want to do the phone calls, or you want to utilize social media, we can help you with all of those as well. Um, or if you just want to share your story, whether it's written or you'd like to capture it in audio or video, uh, we would love to work with advocates uh, in that area as well. So whatever your flavor of advocacy is, just know that it's greatly appreciated and we will support you every step of the way. Um, so again, you know, please use this as a resource. Contact us anytime at policy at michaeljfox.org. That's our email address, policy at michaeljfox.org. So there, I'll turn it back the, over to you. In the follow-up email that you will get from having attended or registered for this webinar, we'll include links to everything that we're talking about. Um, so, you know, please, again, you know, check your email inboxes. Um, but I want to be cognizant of time because, again, we know we've got some folks on this uh, in our audience who advocacy is new. And you might think like, oh, gosh, I could I could actually pick up the phone and call my member of Congress. How do I how do I do that? That seems weird. Am I really allowed to do it? Yes, you are. And Amy and Dana have very kindly volunteered um, to do a little bit of a, a they're going to do a sample phone call. So Dana is going to pretend that she is Senator Burr's staffer because one of Dan, uh, one of Amy's senators is Senator Burr. So Amy is going to pretend that she's calling Senator Burr's office and Dana is going to play the role of the staffer of Senator Burr and we're going to do this live right now so you can kind of see what a phone call might go like for you. Amy and Dana, take it away. Okay, if, if it were me and um, I would write down my notes, I've got some right here, this is a sample and what I, what I would actually do is I'd call Dana and say, Dana, this is what I'm about to say or I'd email it to her and ask her to edit it for me which uh, would be nice because it's a little bit verbose. I'm going to just read it kind of quickly. And, um, but anyways, I might say something like this. Um, my name is Amy Lindbergh and I'm from Wilmington, North Carolina. I'm a retired Navy officer that was stationed at Lejeune back in the eighties when the water was contaminated with TCE and other toxins. As you may know, Parkinson's and other neurological diseases have long latency periods, often decades. In my case, I was misdiagnosed several years before diagnosis was finally confirmed. The gold standard for treatment and even confirmation of a Parkinson's disease is a medication called levodopa, and it's over 50 years old. It doesn't stop the disease, it only treats symptoms. Over time, the side effects destroy the quality of our lives. We need effective drugs and a cure. 
To do this, we need better funded research that keeps up with the demand of the population that's growing and growing. There's over some 200 Americans that will be diagnosed with PD, and tomorrow another 100 will die of it or with it. You know, we've got to get ahead of this. I'm calling today to ask Senator Burr to support the national plan to end Parkinson's Act. Amy, thank you so much. First of all, thank you for your service. And um, thank you for, um, for telling me your story. I know it's not always easy to um, share, share your personal experiences, but um, it's, it's very helpful for, for me and I'll be happy to share that with the Senator. Um, I had a chance to look at some of the materials she sent and, um, and I know one thing the Senator's gonna like a lot about this bill is that we're gonna you know, really make sure that, the, um, that we're using all of our resources in the federal government wisely by looking at everything that's doing, making sure we're not duplicating. So um, mm -hmm. I think that's something that I think he'll really like. What I can do is um, I can take, I will definitely talk to him about this um, and I can get back to you and let you know um, um, if he's willing to be a co-sponsor of the bill. That sounds wonderful. That's exactly what I, I wanted to hear. Just that we have your support and that you'll move forward and, and the favor of a response after that is, is greatly appreciated. So thank you for volunteering to do that, to get back with me. Of course, um, I will do my best to get back in the next week or so. If for any reason you don't hear from me by that point, feel free to reach back out. Um, so, but um, no, I just really appreciate um, learning about it because we didn't know about the bill before. So thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Go Navy. <laughs> <laughs> And look at that in two and a half minutes, three minutes. That is all it took Amy to make that phone call. <laughs> you can see that congressional staff, even as busy as they are and as many issues as they juggle day to day, they're friendly, they don't bite. They're there because their boss, the member of Congress represents you. You are the constituent. Um, again, you can go to michaeljfox.org slash advocacy. You can sign up there to receive email updates on the national plan, all the other policy issues. Uh, you can always reach us at policy at michaeljfox.org and someone will get back to you as soon as humanly possible with whatever question you have, whatever need you have, or whatever policy issue is burning and, and making you concerned or that you think we can get our community rallied around. Um, I would, I'll just, we've got, you know, two, three minutes left. Dustin, Dana, Amy, any other inspirational words of motivation, go get them, we can end Parkinson's with this legislation? Yeah, Definitely, and, uh, and any, any of the actions you do are gonna make a difference, and that's the important. Nothing is too small, and, um, and I think it's a lot of something people get bit by the advocacy book, and, um, but I think we're just very grateful for your support. And I'll, I'll add, Carol, in the spirit of rallying and advocacy, I want everybody to know there will be a national day of action on this legislation. We'll, we will be mobilizing all of our advocates. So I strongly recommend if you are not registered with us yet, please do so. MichaelJFox.org slash advocacy and help us up, help us with this national day of action that will be coming up in September. We're very excited about that. Amy, you are proof that every voice <laughs> matters in advocacy. Anything you want to share with your with your fellow advocates out there who are watching and listening? Keep moving, keep learning, keep the hope. We've got it here with Michael J. Fox. This is a great testimony. Thank you all so much. 
thank you to Dustin, Amy, and Dana. Thank you everyone for watching and listening. We've covered so much information today. This webinar will be available to watch on demand. So keep an eye on your email inbox and our social media channels. We'll share a link to this webinar to watch again and to share with your friends and colleagues. In that email, we'll share helpful resources that can help you learn more about advocacy and all the ways that you can be involved in this work. We hope you found this helpful. Thank you all so much and have a really great day.